It's Link who is literally lost in those woods, and it is Link who is literally looking for Navi, his old friend. Awesome. So where does this get complicated? Well, it gets complicated when we add the second layer to it, because almost everything in Majora's Mask story also has a second allegorical or metaphorical meaning. Here, Link being lost in the woods is a metaphor for Link being lost in life as a whole. On this layer, Link looking for Navi is meant to symbolize Link looking for spiritual guidance, is meant to convey that Link is lost after living through the trauma of a green of time, and that he's looking for guidance. The thing that Majora's Mask often asks is to prioritize prioritize the symbolic meaning of things over telling a cohesive tale on a literal layer. I believe it's this focus on allegories and metaphors that gives Majora's Mask its weird dreamlike quality. It's, it's great, it's truly awesome, I love it. But I also hate it, because this also means that it is a nightmare to discuss this game. One person talks about the opening scene and might talk about its literal meaning, that Link is searching for his lost friend. And you know this person is right, because the literal meaning of this scene is about friendship. The problem is that another person might understand the exact same opening scene to mean that Link is lost and without guidance after the events of Green of Time. And this person is right as well. Two different things can be true at the same time. Mind blowing. I know. This multi layeredness is what makes Majora's Mask so interesting to talk about, but it also means that it is insanely difficult to discuss the game in, say, a public coliseum where different ideas fight against each other until all ideas that ever live by the bloody death. <laughs> Like for example, the internet. So if I'm stating that a thing is about a thing in Mesh Bros. Mask, then I don't mean that this thing is the only thing that the thing is about. If you're wondering why we're taking so much time to establish this bit of fluff at the beginning of the video, well, to be honest, it's a desperate act of self-preservation and it hopes that the Zelda fandom doesn't murder me in a second. But one homicide after the other. So Link continues to ride through the forest. He appears to be tired after a while two new fairies are introduced. Tail and Tentacle, those two fairies fly towards Link's horse, which scares Pona and causes Link to fall off the horse, which kills him. Link dies here, directly afterwards, and that's kind of important, Majora and the Skull Kid appear for the first time. Alright, so before the Zelda fandom pulls out their pitchforks, lights their torches, and storms my castle in a quest to crucify me on a mad pet shaped cross. Look, I'm aware <laughs> that Link doesn't die, die here. Netpad over at Game Theory made a really cool video years ago about how Link is dead during the events of Majora's Mask. It's a fun watch and a really interesting theory, there's just a problem with it. It's debunked. And while this doesn't make the video less interesting to watch, you know, it's a fun thing to think about, even if it ultimately does not work out canonically, the video had the side effect of making an easily debunked theory mainstream, which, you know, is a bit of a red flag for some people in the Zelda fandom. So to summarize the main problem with the Link is dead theory, the reincarnation of Link that appears in Twilight Princess is a blood descendant of the Hero of Time. The Hero of Time is this Link here, the one lying on the ground. This Link must have had a family at some point after the events of Majora's Mask, otherwise this Link here can't be descendant from him, which, you know, probably means he's dead dead after all. So why did I just say that Link dies here then? Well, see, the thing is the following. Even though Link doesn't die on the literal layer of the story, he does die here on the metaphorical one. Metaphorically, Majora's Mask is a story about Link being reborn over and over again, until he heals his trauma by helping others and metaphorically grows up. For this allegory to work, Link has to metaphorically die at the beginning of the game, and he has to do so before he faces Majora for the first time. I believe why the Link is dead theory sounds so plausible on the surface is because it is true, just not in a literal sense. Link dies here on a metaphorical level. The literal Link is fine, however. The literal Link awakens from his metaphorical death and tries to catch the Skull Kid. The Skull Kid rides off with Upona, dragging Link through the woods in consequence. We take control of the Link and chase the kid through the woods until we suddenly run into a seemingly endless abyss in the middle of a tree and fall down. After seeing a strange vision of tons of masks floating towards us, we land on top of a deck of leaf. Skull Kid right in front of us. Skull Kid informs us that he got rid of Epona, implying he killed her. A dreamlike sequence plays where we're chased by Dekus and then we awake again, transformed into a Deku ourselves. We try to chase the kid, but gets stopped by Tattle. This causes her to become separated from her brother Tail, the other fairy. Tattle is now stuck with us. After a short platforming sequence, we make our way through a confusing upside down corridor and enter a clock tunnel at its end. Here, we run into the Happy Mask Salesman, one of the most mysterious characters in the entire Zelda franchise. The first thing he says to us is the following. You've been met with a terrible fate, have you? So what is he talking about? Well, first, and most obviously, it means that we got transformed into a Deku. 
obviously, but I believe there are two additional layers to the sentence. Second, it plays with the metaphorical layer that Link died and is now being reborn in Termina over and over again. Cool, but what is the third potential meaning? Well, for this to make sense, we have to do the Hero of Time signature move. We have to travel back in time. We have to travel <laughs> back to events of Ocarina of Time. That's a Early in Ocarina move. of Time, Navi and Link make their way through the Lost Woods together. There, they run into the Skull Kid for the very first time. Here is what Navi thinks about the Skull Kid the first time she and Link encounter it. Is this what happens to children who wander into the forest? The implication here is that children that get lost in the lost woods transform into skull kids. And this is where things start to become interesting. See, we already chatted that Navi leaving Link at the end of Ocarina of Time symbolizes Link no longer needing a guide anymore. He grew up. The fact that Link is searching for Navi at the beginning of Majora's Mask implies that he's searching for guidance again. It symbolizes that he's a child again. Majora's Mask now starts with Link as a child lost in the forest. The exact thing that Navi believes is what turns someone into a skull kid. So we can not only think about the events of Majora's Mask as they take place in Termina, but we can also think about the story as what is happening in Link's unconsciousness, while in reality he's lying in lost woods, slowly transforming into a skull kid trying to find it off. You know, we can think of Termina as a real place, but we can also think of Termina as a mix of different ideas that float around in Link's unconsciousness. Just to be clear here, I'm not saying that Majora's Mask is absolutely 100% totally taking place in Link's unconsciousness, there's way too little evidence provided in the game to come to this conclusion with any kind of certainty. But, as we'll hopefully soon discover, talking about Termina not only as it is represented, but also as a metaphor for Link's unconsciousness, makes a surprising amount of sense as well. So back to our buddy, the mask selling and very happy, happy mask salesman. The terrible fate that we've been met with could also refer to us slowly transforming into a skull kid. And with this, we've finally established all the necessary fluff to discuss the story on its different layers in detail going forward. Hooray! So let's talk about the land of Termina. On the 23rd of December 1849, just one day before Christmas, Fyodor Dostoevsky found himself standing in line on Semyonov Plaza in St. Petersburg, with three of his friends tied to poles right in front of him. He was probably freezing in the cold Russian winter, wearing nothing but a white horse coat and a horse suit. He was waiting for the first of the execution. Months earlier, Tsar Nikolai had been arrested for reading bad revolutionary literature and for being part of the circle. When the judge pronounced the death sentence, Dostoevsky was just 28 years of age. So, here's where this gets interesting. Because literally the second Dostoevsky and his friends were to be executed, suddenly a letter was read. A letter that had been signed over a month earlier. He and his friends were pardoned. That is, if being sentenced to several years of hard labor in Siberia in the 1850s is to be a pardon, the government had already known for weeks that they would pardon Dostoevsky and his friends, but they didn't tell them until the very last second. They even staged the entire execution, a form of psychological torture that the Russian government at this time liked to do every once in a while. So this story should go on to have a somewhat happy ending. Dostoevsky would live on for dozens and dozens of years, surviving Siberia and going on to become a novelist that is often regarded as one of the greatest novelists in the entirety of world literature. But that's not the reason why we're talking about Dostoevsky's staged execution. The reason we're talking about it is a different one. It is because in Machora's Mask, the land of Termina is eternally stuck in a situation comparable to Dostoevsky's. The people of Termina are all waiting for an execution that never comes. In Termina, the moon is about to fall onto the planet, destroying the entire land in the process. There are just 72 hours from the moment we arrive until all who live in this land are to die by the falling moon. And the closer this moment comes, the more aware its inhabitants become of this fact. On the final night, we can find the inhabitants of Termina coping with the fact that they believe they are about to die everywhere. It's an incredibly brutal, sad and melancholic setting. The more we get to know the world, the more we learn about Termina's inhabitants, and the more we start to help them, the more this sadness builds up. It's one of Majora's last greatest strengths. The game is the slow descent to melancholic sadness. The game permanently confronts us with the fact that nothing we do in this world is of permanence, be it either because the moon will erase all life, or be it because we reset the time loop. 
but for now, we have no idea about any of this. For now, we are nothing more than a dangerous prop that has absolutely no idea what is going on. During our first three years <laughs> of we are trapped in a deco form and can't leave the town yet. The game oh, it's because of the use of time to introduce Clock Town and all of its citizens. We have to great dairy. We play hide and seek with the bombers, a secret kids club that tries to help the inhabitants of Termina. We learn that the skull kid is on top of the clock tower, probably summoning the moon. We trade a moon tier for access to a deco flower and finally, we make our way towards the top of the clock tower on the night of the final day. Here we confront Skull Kid. Tail gives us hints on where to find help. The swamp, the mountains, the ocean and the canyon before Skull Kid brutally shuts her down. We shoot a bubble towards Skull Kid which causes him to drop the ocarina. Once we pick up the ocarina, we suddenly remember our goodbye from Princess Zelda. She tells us that she'll never forget the days we spent together in Hyrule. One of the very few times Hyrule is mentioned in Majora's Mask and that she believes in her heart that the day will come oh, cool. we will meet again. Did it. We remember a song Zelda taught us, the song of time. Playing this song allows us to travel through time back to the very beginning of the three day cycle. There, we run into the Happy Mask salesman again, who teaches us the song of healing. This song transforms us back into Link and gives us the Deku Scrub Mask that allows us to transform into a Deku at will. Hooray! And with what the hell, Hell Mask? Intro finally comes to a stop and the real game begins. Every 72 hours, the moon will crash into the and destroy the life. We can return to the beginning of the cycle and play the song of time whenever we want, but all changes that we made to the world. Once a pirate, so always a pirate, I guess. Passes on a timer and no changes permanent. Our main goal for now is to visit the four areas that Larry spoke about, to help the people there, to make it through the dungeons there, and to free the four giants that are trapped in the four heroes. So let's do this. Let's quickly talk about the four main quests in Majora's Mask, and let's discuss the gameplay and the dungeon design. Well, let's. <laughs> that we have to visit are in the four cardinal directions. Interestingly, the layout of Termina has a slight resemblance to a clock. Our first stop is the swamp area. Something is poisoning waters in the swamp. One of the local witches got lost in the forest, the Deku princess is missing, and worst of all, the Deku king has imprisoned a monkey and plans to execute it because he falsely believes it is responsible for the princess's disappearance. We help the witch break into the Deku castle, learn a new song from the trapped monkey and head towards the first dungeon in the game, the Woodfall Temple. So, the Woodfall Temple. The Woodfall Temple is the first temple in the game and it is also the first dungeon that we can change entirely by our actions. We can cure the water here, which makes it possible to swim in it. This change affects several rooms at once, which means it really challenges our understanding of the dungeon as a whole. That's a bit of a theme for Majora's Mask's dungeons, and it is one of the game's biggest strengths. The Snow Temple has manipulated a huge pillar in its center by breaking out blocks as a core. The Water Temple has manipulated the direction the water flows and guide the electricity for the entire temple, and the Stone Tower Temple has as famously flipped the entire dungeon on its head. The dungeons are generally a huge step up from Ocarina of Times. Some of them, like the Water Temple or the Snow Tower Temple, are at least my humble only and among the very best dungeons Nintendo ever created. Their challenging nature combined with the many uses of the different masks and the great ways to permanently change some of the temple's features just makes them really memorable experiences. And the Woodfall Temple already shows all those qualities as the very first dungeon. After defeating the boss here with three the first giant, those scenes are really interesting because the way they are presented is really celebrative in its tone but melancholic. It's almost a bit sad to encounter this guardian for the very first time. The giant teaches us the oath to order. Once we free all four giants, we can use this song to call them to help save the land. The next giant is in the mountains in the north. So the snowfall mountains played by a cold winter that refuses to end. We first make our way to the Goron village where all the Gorons are in utter terror because the Goron's eldest son refuses to stop crying. The eldest is the only one who knows the song that calls him but he has gone missing. In another part of the city we run into the owl who guides us towards the lens of truth. The lens of truth allows us to climb this wall and top it we find the grave of the Goron hero Dormani. And there is a song of healing here we get a Goron mask which transforms us into Dormani whenever we put it on. Quite literally. The other Gorons even mistake us for their long-form hero if we talk to them while wearing the mask. As a Goron, we get hyper strength at 
the ability to roll, which is an incredibly cool form of movement. The Goron roll just has something hectic and uncontrollable to it. It almost feels as if someone forgot to down you a little bit for the final release of the game. It's great. That's generally something Majora's Mask really excels at. It's a joy to move around, transform into a Goron, and then go scrap or to swim as a Sora, which is really interesting. You know, most games struggle to make the movement of a single main character enjoyable for the entirety of the game. But Majora's Mask has four main characters that all control fundamentally different, yet all are a joy to use. So, how did they pull this off? Well, I believe it's because of a very simple trick. Every transformation is vastly superior to Link in one way or another. The deck of scrub can jump over water and his spin is a bit faster than Link's roll. The Goron plays like a Formula 1 racer and the Sora has insanely high speed out of water and incredibly high mobility. They are all superior to Link one way or another, which means we are never sad when we transform into one of them for a section. Alright, we can help the Gorons with their screaming problem by freezing the endless Goron, who is trapped in an ice block on the road towards the city. We have freeze him, he teaches us the first part of an old Goron lullaby that we can use to make the Goron kid fall asleep and reach the next temple. The snow temple is even better than a woodfall temple before it. The center of the dungeon is this huge tower shaped room that we slowly have to climb upwards. Halfway through the dungeon, however, we activate a switch that raises a gigantic pillar upwards that passes with which paths we can take to the top. And yeah, it's great. I thought we ran into the second boss of the game. So let's quickly chat about them. There are four main bosses in the game. Odolwa in the Woodfall Temple, Gold in Snow Mountain, Gyur in the Great Bay Temple, and Twin Mold in the Stone Tower Temple. And it pains me to say, but at least in the original version of the game, none of those boss fights are pretty good. Odolwa is the strangest of the bunch. In the M64 release of the game, it is incredibly unclear how to even defeat the boss. I usually just run around hitting him, beating the ass, and after a while he just randomly dies. It's a really weird Gold atop the snow temple is a lot better. We find him as a Goron, we race him in rounds, trying to hit him until he falls down, which either allows us to get tons of hits in as a Goron or to transform back into a tendency hand. It's my favorite fight in the original game. Racing against him as a Goron just has something really satisfying. Yurok, on the other hand, Holy fancy Yurok, so story time. I actually played Majora's Mask shortly after it was released. I must have been about 10 or maybe 11 years old back then. I remember that I made it up until the Watcher Temple as a kid. So I might have had some help from an adult, I honestly don't remember. What I do remember, however, is that my playthrough came to an abrupt end. Once I faced Yurok, my 10 year old alter ego wasn't able to beat him before the time limit reset the lunch. I remember trying it over and over, but I simply wasn't able to make it through the fight and eventually had to quit the game in pure frustration. I have just replayed the game as an adult. Yeah, I see why I wasn't able to do this as a kid. The fight is really frustrating. The boss is quite difficult, but for all the completely wrong reasons. The main challenge here isn't shooting the boss. That's incredibly easy. It also isn't damaging your rock. That's no problem either. The huge challenge in this fight is to swim out of the water fast enough as a Sora after we hit him. The real boss is this ledge. For whatever reason, it is really difficult to grab this ledge. But if Link decides no ledge grabbing today, the boss swallows us as a whole immediately afterwards, and we take a ton of damage. So. Yeah, it's my least favorite boss in the game by far, as it actively destroyed my entire childhood. Which brings us to Twin Mode, the fourth and final main boss in the game. I'm torn on this fight, so mechanically, it is a train wreck. But to be completely honest, most fights in Majora's Mask are train wreck by today's standard. The thing that makes Majora's Mask so interesting to play in 2023 are its themes, the atmosphere and a great story. The combat system certainly is not. Mechanically, the fight manages to somehow walk the thin line of it being almost impossible to hit Twin Mode, while somehow, at the same time, being an incredibly and way too easy encounter. But on the other, other hand, you know, fighting in this gigantic empty desert among those ruins, using a giant's mask to grow huge dueling low cracks at the same time, is mechanically the perfect fit for the Stone Tower Temple. So overall, I'm a Twin Mode fan, even though the fight itself is disappointing. That leaves us with three bosses that are mechanically disappointing and one boss that is decent and that is kind of a problem Time for a for game like Majora's Mask. See, if we're going for 100% completion and we're very likely to do most of those bosses twice or even three or four times. Beating those bosses is what causes the changes to the overworld. Beating Odolwa, for example, cures the swamp from the poison, which opens up lots of side content. If we do not complete all the side content the first time we beat the boss, which is not going to happen with a blind playthrough, then 
we have to defeat it again. Every time we want to do something that is gated, we have this one peak humor. It's a fact that bosses range from mediocre to really frustrating because it's a problem in the game since we are likely to fight them several times. Who and Ray? Our next stop are the Soras of the Great Bay, the worst area in the original game from a gameplay perspective. At least in my opinion. But before we discuss everyone's favorite sea folk, let's do a quick intro route. Let's chat about something else. Let's talk about the PlayStation 2. On the 26th of October 2000, Sony released the PlayStation 2 in North America. To the surprise of pretty much everyone, Sony released the successor to the original PlayStation as the market leader in the home console market. The PlayStation 1 did the impossible. The original PlayStation had outsold the Nintendo 64, a success that barely anyone would have thought possible just five years prior. Nintendo had single-handedly revitalized the home console market after the great video game crash of the 80s. The NES was the almost unchallenged market leader. Nintendo also won the second generation of home consoles. Sega put up a good fight, but in the end, Nintendo clearly stayed on top. So when the third generation of home consoles rolled around, Nintendo was positioned to win. Nintendo had established years of trust with consumers over the past decade. They were the clear market leader. They owned many of the biggest franchises in gaming at the time. They already had a huge lead sure, for Sega, the and their only other competitor was Sony, a no-name in the home console market. I they can't beat her without it. the handheld market, and they had the console generation defining title in the pipeline. Ocarina of Time, a game that critics would almost universally call the best game created up until then, once it finally released. Nintendo was perfectly positioned to take home the third generation of home consoles. It seemed unthinkable that someone would overtake Nintendo this generation, given the lead that they had built up. Five years later, the PlayStation had outsold the Nintendo 64 3 to 1. Sony surprised everyone and not only beat Nintendo, but devastated them. The Nintendo 64 ended up selling about 33 million copies. The PS1 sold over 100 million. So how did Sony manage the impossible? Well, there were many things that gave Sony an edge over the N64. The first one is that Sony used the back then revolutionary technology of CD-ROMs for their games. So for the younger generation, CD-ROMs are like magical round mirrors that were able to store insane amounts of data, like 600 megabytes at once. The other big edge that Sony had over the N64 was that the console launched over a year earlier and was able to gain a head start because of this. Which brings us to the 26th of October 2000 the day oh, the PlayStation 2 launched, because Sony was trying to pull the exact same trick on Nintendo once again. The PlayStation 2 launched a year before the GameCube. So why am I telling this tale in a video about Majora's Mask, one might ask? Well, here's the plot twist. Not only the PlayStation 2 released on the 26th of October 2000 in North America, Majora's Mask did too. Majora's Mask literally released in the States the same day the PlayStation 2 did. And this little fact tells us a lot about how stressful the development of Majora's Mask Mask must have been. Ocarina of Time was released in Japan late in 1998. Majora's Mask had an early 2000 release in Japan. Majora's Mask was made in only a little more than a year. Ocarina of Time got delayed several times until Nintendo was truly happy with the game. For Majora's Mask, that simply wasn't an option. There wasn't room to delay the game. It had to make a 2000 release or the sequel to the most critically acclaimed game of all time would release straight into the GameCube's marketing campaign. So I can only imagine Imagine the pressure that the Zelda team probably had been under. Not only are they making a sequel to the then best game of all time, but they also had to do so in about a year, with a hard deadline ahead, because the N64 was at the end of its life cycle. And what did the team decide to do? They decided to go with a completely new and unique concept. They decided to go into insane fanatic death and tell a complicated, multi-layered narrative about healing, grief and suffering. They decided to create three additional forms of movement for Link. They decided to build a Zelda game with the most substantial side content up until this day. They decided to have the game take place in a three-day Groundhog Day setting, and they decided to not even have the game take place in Hyrule or the final bad guy the Ganondorf. Whenever I think about how Majora's Mask came to be, it just completely blows my mind. Deciding to develop a game like Majora's Mask under the circumstances the Zelda team faced back then, it's just utter insanity. And they pulled it off. While the game is far from flawless, there are many things that Majora's Mask does miles better than any other game in the series. I cannot imagine the level of self-esteem necessary to even. You guys want to know like the this. first ever dungeon crawler game I ever I'm played? I'm glad that they tried. 
And with this, let's return to our summary of the main story and our quick little gameplay discussion. Our next stop on our journey to save Termina is... Actually, it would more accurately be saying that... It would be the first one I was informed about, the first one I knew, via YouTube. Because technically the first ever dungeon crawler game I played is Mary Skelter, which I ended up really liking, and I've been in love with the genre ever since. Uh, I believe potentially there might be another one that came earlier, but the earliest dungeon crawler game I know of, uh, well, I guess there's Chocobo's Dungeon, but that's a mystery dungeon type game, not a dungeon crawler with the first person perspective and stuff. It has randomly generating stuff in the doll that other good stuff mystery dungeon games are known for with all their roguelike shit that I really don't like. Anyway, it's Sakura Dungeon. a banner to deal with this bullshit. EDM Incorporations. Huh, that sounds like a really cool name for a band. EDM Incorporations. Saber Tooth Tiger. Does I Minara mean, even have a subclass? Ninja, right. <laughs> but I'll just have their passives. We should have bought Umag instead. I'm doing well so far. scared of how much damage they can do so I'm mostly playing defensive. Hmm. 
Seriously, when the hell did Mayara get so fast? Doesn't she usually go last? Is it because she has reflexes? Or whatever that skill is called? So much defense, jeez. Armor Piercer seems to have really low accuracy. Seriously. Thank you. 
my least favorite area in the game. So what's the problem with the Great Bay area? Well, it's certainly not the area itself. The area is fantastic. Everything here rips sadness out of every inch. It is an incredibly melancholic and interesting area. That's not the problem. Neither is the Sora transformation the problem. Swimming as a Sora for the sea for the very first time is actually one of the highlights of the game. The problem is the egg quest. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Once we arrive in the Great Bay, something really unusual happens. We see a Sora float unconsciously on the water. Once we bring him back to safety, we witness one of the weirdest death scenes I've ever seen in all of fiction, not just in games. He starts to sing us a song, and then he dies right in front of us. The song sounds like this. <laughs> just for anyone who never played Majora's Mask, I swear I'm not making this up. This is in the game. Wait, hey! about how the singer of this band laid strange eggs and how he certainly won't die in peace, baby. I love it. We play the song of healing here, we get the Sora mask, and thus the egg quest begins. The eggs that Hulu, the lead singer of the Sora band, the Indiegogos, laid were stolen by pirates. Four of them are hidden in a pirate fortress in which we have to sneak into. Three are hidden in an eel infested area called the Pinnacle Rock. And funnily enough, both areas are great. Pirate fortress is a long, non-linear stealth dungeon with some puzzles holding in between and is a great change of pace. The Pinnacle Rock area is one of the strangest and most magical areas in the game. It has this really unique atmosphere to it. We have to recover all the seven eggs and we have to put them into this container in the research laboratory to learn a song that allows us to reach the water dungeon by summoning a turtle. So far so good. The huge problem, we need to put the Sora eggs into a bottle in order to transport them. The original version of the game it is highly unlikely that players have four bottles at this point on a blind playthrough. It is possible to have four bottles but it is highly unlikely. But if we only have, say, two bottles at this point, then this side quest becomes insanely tedious. Because if we only have two bottles, we have to play the entire pirate fortress twice in a row. We can't grab all the eggs in one sitting. Even worse, we also have to travel to the pinnacle rock twice. This introduces an insane amount of backtracking into a game that is on a timer. If we happen to take especially long at a pirate fortress, something I remember happening to me as a kid, and we're forced to travel back in time which also puts all the eggs back into the fortress and the eel infested waters, which, well, which is super duper frustrating and the big problem with this area. Luckily, the Great Bay Temple is great. The Great Bay Temple is one of my favorite temples in the entire franchise. Flat out, it's such an interesting concept and it's executed in such a brilliant way. I love it. The dungeon is built around two main gimmicks. The first one is this large room with a strong current that allows us to only flow into certain entrances depending on the rotation of the current. The other gimmick are several large wires that lead through the temple and that carry an electrical signal, but that are blocked at several parts per switch, which means that we have to figure out why the electricity does leave a certain room it enters and then flip the switch. Those two gimmicks turn the dungeon into a huge puzzle box where rooms are relevant long first left them, and where we are forced to understand how everything fits together while exploring the dungeon. It's really challenging, but in a good way, and once all the pieces fall together, it is incredibly satisfying. The Watcher Temple is unironically one of my favorite dungeons that Nintendo ever crafted for any Zelda game. It is truly worthy of a spot in the Zelda Hall of Fame. After murdering Deerock here, our next stop is the Ikana Valley, a favorite area in the game. The war between the Ikana Kingdom and another faction called the Garros devastated the valley. Almost everyone living here died during this fighting, but not even the death of most of its inhabitants brought the canyon peace. The land is cursed. The Ikana and the Garo continue to fight even in death. The Ikana Canyon features the most content before we finally reach the dungeon. First, we have to defeat the captain of the Ikana Guard, which rewards us with a mask and allows us to command the dead in a graveyard to open up the graves. In one of those graves, we find an angry composer who was tricked by his brother and is still full of anger towards him, who teaches us the Song of Storms. We settle the dispute between the brothers by playing this song to the other brother, which returns the water to the valley. Next, we have the little girl save her father. The father is slowly transforming into a Gipto. Giptos are basically zombies in the Zelda universe. Because of her father's slow zombification, she was forced to lock him up in a closet. Once the water flows through the canyon again, the pill is restored, which causes the house to play this tune. The music causes the Giptos to roam around the house too. 
went to advance, which in consequence causes the Earth to swallow them. We'll try to make sense of this weird little dancing to death scene in a second. Also, if you think I'm reaching with my air dancing here interpretation, fine, I might be, but it certainly isn't the only instance of dancing zombies in the game. After saving the father and reuniting him with his girl, we're rewarded with the Kipto mask. With this mask, we can solve the long trading sequence in a well on Rikana that ultimately rewards us with the mirror shield. The mirror shield has a really interesting design. The second we pick up the mirror shield, this incredibly sad and shocked face stares directly at us for the rest of the entire game. With the mirror shield, we can enter Ikana Castle, a really interesting mini dungeon that ends with us confronting the undead king of Ikana. We find him in a boss battle and afterwards he says a couple of words that I believe are at the center of Majora's Mask themes. He says, believing in your friends and embracing that belief by forgiving failure, those feelings have vanished from our hearts, implying that this is what caused the curse that plagues those lands, and then he teaches us the effigy of acting us. A song that allows us to create an empty right. copy she of ourselves. Them, this time around. The Swiss American so psychiatrist Elisabeth Kubler-Ross is famous for defining the five stages of grief in her book on death and dying. According to her, people who realize that they are about to die go through five stages of grief in a certain order, namely denial, mm, anger, bargaining depression, and lastly acceptance. So, scientifically speaking, this model is far from undisputed, but it managed to make it into the mainstream and is certainly not completely wrong. So, here's why I'm bringing this up. There's a popular fan theory out there that the four main areas in Clock Town are modeled after the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. According to the theory, Clock Town represents denial. You know, the townspeople are in denial that the moon is about to crash down. The swamp represents anger. The Deku King was angry at the monkey for irrational reasons. The Snowhead Mountain represents bargaining. Nendid Armani begs us to bring him back to life with our magic. The Great Bay represents depression. With its general oppressive atmosphere and Lulu, the Sora girl lost her voice and isn't speaking anymore. And finally, Kana Valley represents acceptance, with the two brothers settling their dispute and the king accepting what has happened to the valley. And at least in my humble opinion, I think the theory is correct. Maybe it certainly kind of fits. I don't think the five stages of grief were the main inspiration for the areas. More on this in a second. But I buy the idea that they had the five stages of grief in their mind when they were designing the main areas. Here's the thing, however. I don't believe it's the only time when they model something around the stages of grief. Because at least in my reading, the entirety of the Tana Valley plot loosely follows the stages of grief as well. The first thing we have to do here is to command skeletons that are still acting as if they were alive to open graves. Once they open the graves, they literally jump inside of them. I believe this represents denial that they died and think having them open and entering the graves symbolizes them overcoming their denial. The next stage would be anger. And the next thing we have to do is to settle the dispute between the composing brothers that play the song of storms. We're literally told that the thunder in the song is the brother's anger. Playing this song settles the dispute and moves us into the next stage of bargaining. And would you believe it, the next thing we do is to literally bargain with the dead to reach the mirror shield. The mirror shield is the one that fits the least, but I believe the mirror shield represents depression itself. You know, it reflects light and it would also explain why it is designed the way it is. Finally, we reach the stage of acceptance when we defeat the king of the Kana castle and hear him speak about forgiveness. So here's the thing with Majora's Mask. I have absolutely no idea if the team planned this or if I'm simply reading way too much into it. Majora's Mask is so incredibly full of symbolism that takes place on so many layers at once that I just have no idea what they were actually planning and what is me going full-blown great great tinfoil mode. If I'm correct that the Kana Valley up until this point symbolized Link going through the five stages of grief, however, but the implications of this are rather interesting because we aren't done with the Kana Valley yet. There's one more area that we have to visit here, an area that we support only visit after we came to accept our own grief, my favorite area in the entire game, and the only area in Termina where we can find the Triforce. The Old Testament tells the story of the people of Shinar, people who arrived in those lands as a united race. There, they built a city, and in the middle of the city, they began building a tower. A tower so high that its top would have reached into heaven itself. 
the Tower of Babel, God saw the tale, saw the people building the tower, a tower that was meant to reach into her realm, to stop the mortals from building a tower up into the heavens. She confounded the languages of the people building it, so that they were no longer able to communicate with each other, which made completing the tower impossible. So, if we take this story at face value, then it is the explanation the Old Testament gives us for why people speak different languages. But there's obviously a second layer to this little tale. It's a tale about hubris and arrogance. It's a tale about humanity arrogantly trying to reach the heavenly realms of earthly means. It's a parable about how humans should not attempt to put themselves on the same level as God. So, what has all of this to do with Majora's Mask's Stone Tower? Well, two things. First, Majora's Mask Stone Tower has some obvious parallels to the story of the Tower of Babel. The Stone Tower is quite literally a human-made tower that stretches into the clouds. But second, there's a strong theme of blasphemy going on in this area. This area has a theme of humans putting themselves above God, which brings us to the Triforce. See, the only place in which the Triforce can be found in Germany are on the path to the Stone Tower and in the Stone Tower itself. But it's not the fact that we find the Triforce here that is fascinating. The fascinating thing is where we find it. There are several stone switches on the ground that move blocks around. We have to play the energy of emptiness to lock the stones in place and build a bridge towards the dungeon. So far so good. Here's the thing however, those blocks aren't merely blocks with faces. If you take a close look at them, then we can see that they are clearly shaped like cowering humans. And if we take a look at the bottom of those blocks, then we can find the Triforce on them directly above the butt cheeks, on the spot where the genitals would be. To make matters even worse, the creatures lick the poor Triforce. Whoever created those certainly wasn't a huge fan of Fire the Goddess, the royal family of Hyrule or Zelda. So if you think this is kind of out of place for a Zelda game, don't worry. Nintendo felt the same way because this Triforce is mysteriously missing in 3DS Remake. Anyway, that's not the final thing that is interesting here. See, if we take a closer look at the dungeon entrance, then we can see that the entrance has actually Majora's mask drawn on top of it. It's just upside down. If we enter the Stone Tower dungeon, there's another broken statue of the mask upside down in front of us. Then, there is this hand placed atop the tower, a hand that shows a burning finger towards the sky, another symbol that seems to mock the goddess. Finally, there are four phallic shaped pillars standing around the entrance to the temple atop the stone tower, most likely represent the four giants. All of those symbols are either symbols of blasphemy or upside down symbols of Majora's mask. The gameplay gimmick of the stone tower dungeon is to turn the entire tower on its head. The way we flip the tower is by using light arrows. Finally, we also find the giant's mask in this temple, the mask that transforms Link into a literal giant. What do we make out of all of this? Well, there's a popular fan theory that tries to make sense of it. The idea is roughly the following. Long time ago, the people of Termina used to worship the goddess of time, but then they decided to change their beliefs for some reason. They chose to worship the four giants instead. They built a stone tower as a mockery of the old goddess, a tower that was supposed to contain a portal towards her heavenly throne. They put up fellows shaped statues of their new gods, the giants, to mock the goddess. They hid the giant's mask in the temple to worship their new gods and put the triforce onto those blocks as additional mockery. But then, the goddess found out what they were doing. As a punishment, she flipped the tower upside down. Instead of linking to the heavens, the portal now linked metaphorically to hell. We actually go through this portal while the tower is flipped. It links to the desert where we fight against wind molds. The idea is that Machora was originally prison in this desert. Machora arrived in Termina because the people mocked the goddess who in turn punished them. And personally, I love this theory. I believe that is pretty much exactly what happened. There is just one thing which I personally see different, the role of the giants, but to understand all of this we first have to make another quick detour and have to have a chat about the origins of the giants. Long before the events of Majora's Mask, the Skull Kid and the four giants were actually friends. But then the giants told the people of Termina on the day of the Carnival of Time that they would guard the land from now on while lying dormant. Each giant walked 100 steps into one of the four directions we find them in and went to rest there. If the people of Termina were ever in need, they could call the giants for help, which left the Skull Kid behind the bone. The Skull Kid was stricken by the giant's departure. It felt neglected and alone, and so anger arose in it. It started to spread its anger all throughout Termina. After a while, the people of Termina were fed up with the kid's mischief and called the sleeping giants for help. And the giants answered. They ordered Skull Kid to leave Termina, threatening to kill him 
she disobeyed, and so the skull kid left Termina, his former friends, banished him. Awesome. So with this we've established almost everything that we need to understand what I believe to be the small misconception of Stone Tower Theory. But before we return to our four fellowship pillars, we first need to make another detour. We first have to talk about Machor's masks and side quests. <laughs> Michel Ende that was released in 1973. The book is about a young girl, fittingly called Momo, who discovers a terrible secret. One day, employees of the Tide Savings Bank appear in her little town and start to convince the adults to save their precious time at their bank, where they promise to pay them good interest. They promise us that if we were to give up our time now, we may enjoy a magnitude of more time at some point in the future. And the adults all start to save their time. Slowly, the lovely town Momo lives in changes. It transforms into a cold and hectic place. Until one day, Momo discovers the terrifying truth. The time savings bank isn't taking care of the adult's time. It's a fraud. As a matter of fact, the people are cheated out of their safe time. The employees of the bank smoke up the safe time in cigars to stay alive by burning through other people's lifetime. Luckily, Momo and her friends manage to bring this fraudulent business model to a fall after living through a lot of adventures. The end. So what does Michel and this Momo have to do with Machora's mask? Well, nothing on the surface, except that both are loosely interested in exploring the concept of time. What they do have in common, however, is the way they present their ideas. We previously discussed that Majora's Mask plot takes place on several layers. One is the literal oh, plot that to. is going on. The other one is what the game actually wants to say with this plot. The same is true for Momo, kind of obviously. On the surface, Momo is about a young girl defeating a criminal enterprise. But what the book really wants to comment on is how we decide to spend our precious time on Earth, how we often aren't living for the moment, and how we often fail to even ask for who we're doing what we do and who truly benefits from the work we do. The entire plot of Momo is a metaphor for something else, which brings us to Machora's mask, because pretty much everything in Machora's mask is an allegory for something else too, which brings us to Machora's mask side quests. On the Romani ranch, there is a man farming chicken called Brock, full of sorrow. He understands that the moon is about to crash into Termina, and he has kind of accepted that, but he's heartbroken nonetheless, because he won't get to see his hatchlings grow up into adult chicks. If we wear the Bremen mask, we can march with the chicks until they grow up, which makes Brock all happy and chuckle. We got to see his chicken grow up, after all. In the game, that is a really strange side quest, but if we think about it for a second, we can see that the whole thing is a metaphor for something else. Brock's story isn't about a man who never gets to see his chicks grow up, it's about a father who never gets to see his children grow up. We help him come to terms with this. The Gorman brother that is devastated that he won't get to perform at the night of the carnival and who is found drinking milk at the bar is meant to symbolize someone who succumbs to alcoholism because his creative dreams stay unfulfilled. The ancient quest is meant to represent true love that never comes to be because of circumstance. When we race with the Deku Butler, we are doing a fun racing minigame. Metaphorically, we are helping a father heal after the death of his son. Then there is the father that slowly transforms into a zombie in a wardrobe while zombies are circling around the house. I believe this quest represents becoming estranged from your own child because of the responsibilities of adult life. It's the responsibilities of adult life that are slowly turning him into a zombie that his own child is barely able to recognize anymore. The reason why I believe this to be the case is because the way we get rid of the zombies around the house is by getting them to dance to a child. I, 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 I unironically want that little bit. Reconnect those zombies with their childhood by making them dance, an action that has no purpose. He doesn't than summon the animals anymore. Himself. Then there is Lulu, the Sora girl, who literally lost her unborn children and can't speak anymore. You know? It's a bit heavy, but I believe it is a metaphor for a miscarriage. She, you know, literally lost her unborn children. Finally, there is the ranch side of West. <sighs> okay, so here's what I believe to be the symbolism of the alien attacks. Romani tells us that every year on the fourth night of the carnival, aliens come and abduct the cows. The adults won't believe her, but she's training so that she's able to fight them off this time. And would you believe it? The aliens actually appear and try to steal the cows. If we fight them off, Romani later reveals to us that she did not tell her sister about the aliens, so as not to worry her, and asks us if we want to stay on the farm and want to sleep in her bed instead of her, which would make her 
sister happy too. We don't fight off the aliens, Romani is abducted alongside the cows and we find her traumatized the next morning. So with aliens abducting a child at night, the kid not being able to talk about it with adults as they would believe her, the kid hoping that a hero comes and sleeps in her bed, the sister apparently also being in need of a hero and the kid being traumatized if help doesn't come at night. So um, yeah, at least in my reading, the whole thing is a metaphor for child abuse. It's not even that subtle. Just to be clear here, you may disagree with my interpretations of the symbolic meaning of all of those child things. Child abuse? Yeah, that fine. makes so much you know, sense. I think there is such a thing as a definitive answer to what all those quests represent. I believe Nintendo purposefully made all of them very abstract with a wide variety of possible interpretations. The thing that I want to establish is that my understanding of those quests is 100% the correct way to read their symbolism. What I want to establish is that all of Majora's Mask side quests represent one form of the purest and most painful traumas that human beings can potentially go through. Majora's Mask side quests are a terrifying medley of the most serious forms of human suffering. Those side quests fulfill a narrative function. They are a plot device for Link's own story in Majora's Mask. On a metaphorical level, Link encounters all sorts of people who all go through an insane trauma. Those are the side quests. The main quest is about Link's own trauma. So to understand the symbolism of the main story, we first have to understand Link. At the beginning of Majora's Mask, Link is very likely in emotional pain. He saved the kingdom of Hyrule as an adult and got sent back in time by Zelda, but that victory came at the cost. The Link we see at the beginning of Majora's Mask just suffered through the events of Ocarina of Time, an incredibly difficult journey that Link innocently got caught in by circumstance and by no wrongdoing of his own. The Link we see at the beginning has lost his childhood. He was literally forced to grow up in Ocarina of Time. The Link we see at the beginning has lost his strength and his status as a hero. At the end of Ocarina of Time, Link is sent back in time, so no one in Hyrule knows about his heroic deeds since he did them in an alternative future. Additionally, the strength he acquired in adult form is taken away from him again. Finally, the Link that we see at the beginning has lost his home, Hyrule. In the Hyrule Historia, that goes in death on the Zelda lore and was released together with Skyward Sword, we learn a bit more about the hero of time. So I'm paraphrasing here, but what the book states is basically that Zelda sent Link away from Hyrule after the events of Ocarina of Time to make sure that the Gate of Time can never be opened again. If we take this additional piece of lore that the Hyrule Historia provides into consideration, then Link suffers through a fourth trauma at the beginning of Majora's Mask. He was banished from his homeland of Hyrule. Alright, so with all of this fluff firmly established, let's take a look at the four main areas in the game and let's try to figure out if they are metaphors for something else. In the first area, the swamp, an innocent creature of the forest is punished because it tried to help the princess. The monkey is punished for the disappearance of the Deku princess, even though the monkey actually tried to save the princess. You know, I think the plot in the swamp has a pretty strong symbolic resemblance to Link's story in Ocarina of Time. Metaphorically, the monkey is Link. Link is an innocent creature of the forest. The princess is Zelda, so the monkey that is punished for trying to save the princess actually represents Link who is punished for trying to save Zelda. To add to this, the monkey is a hero that no one but the princess recognizes for one. Another thing that happens to Link. At the end of the swamp area, the princess confronts her father, the monkey is released and the Deku realize that the monkey is actually a hero. I believe the swamp area represents Link coming to terms with the trauma that he must have suffered through after being torn into the events of a green of time by circumstance. Next, we are to the Goron area. The Goron main plot is about two things. On the one side, it is about a strong and mighty hero that died earlier than he had hoped to. I believe this represents Link coping with losing his strength when Zelda sent him back in time. The other plot revolves around a child that literally can't stop crying. In my understanding of the story, this child represents Link in its current form, crying for his former strength. You know, the strong adult is dead while the child can't stop crying. It parallels what is happening to Link. At the end of the Goron quest, the child is finally able to sleep again, symbolizing that Link came to terms with this aspect of his trauma. Next, we visit oh, the Great right. Bay area. This area is about Gerudo pirates stealing unborn children. Ganondorf himself is the king of the Gerudo in Ocarina of Time. Because of this, I believe the Gerudo pirates symbolize, well, Ganondorf, obviously. The plot in the ocean area is metaphorically about Ganondorf stealing children, which would be a metaphor for Link losing his childhood because of the events of Ocarina of Time. At the end, Link saves the stolen children from the pirates and enables them to have a childhood. Quite literally, it causes them to be born. I believe this symbolizes. Hmm. 
God damn it. Alright, so it doesn't matter which choice we pick. We'll still get the true ending. The real, at least gameplay wise, crutch that happens in the choice is the sub is the additional class you get the choice to unlock. The Ig Droid or the Shogun. I have no idea how the Ig Droid and Shogun play in the original, but depending, <laughs> that might determine who you decide to side with. <laughs> Everyone here is 54 except for Echo, that kinda sucks. She's still probably the one that deals the most damage though. Know? I just realized I forgot to use my Laudanum. As a snake coming to terms with his fur trauma, next is the Ikana Kenya. This is where things become really Oops. interesting. So we already established that Link goes through the five stages of grief here. When Link arrives at the Stone Tower Temple, he symbolically has reached acceptance of what has happened to him. Now Link is able to confront the most severe trauma of all that he faced. The trauma that caused Machora to be released into the world. His trauma of being sent away from Hyrule. His trauma of Princess Zelda banishing him to make sure Hyrule is safe. The trauma that the Stone Tower represents. So most of you probably already know where we are heading, but there is still one final thing that we have to establish beforehand. We have to do a quick chat about Skull Kid. Skull Kid isn't a villain in Machora's mask. The mask is. At some point, after being sent away by his friends the giant, the Skull Kid steals Majora's mask from the happy salesman. This mask 
corrupts him. It is the mask that does the evil things, not the kid themselves. In the literal interpretation of the plot, this calculate is a vessel for something truly evil. That is We're what is going on in the future but layer I still of the have story. To but that what guy does the calculate up? represent on the symbolic Regardless. and metaphorical layer of the story? But that's where things get really interesting. Because metaphorically, this calculate is Link. Think about the following. The story of Link at the beginning of Majora's Mask is the story of a boy who lost his friend and got sent away by Zelda, a godlike deity that is guarding his homeland. Navi left Link and Zelda sent him away from Hyrule in order to protect its people. The story of the Skull Kid is the story of a child being first left behind by its friends who became guarding deities for the people of Termina and later sent the kid away. The Cheyans left Skull Kid and later Ooh, sent him away from Termina in an effort to protect the land. Skull Kid's story mirrors the Link's story. As I understand the story, Skull Kid is a symbolic representation of Link's self, a side that is corrupted by Machora. Machora being Link's dark side that was able to take over because of the pain and the many traumas that the events of Ocarina of Time caused. The mask is also literally shaped by the corrupted heart. The first three areas represented Link coming to terms with most of those traumas. The Ikana Canyon symbolizes Link going through the stages of grief and coming to accept what happened to him. And the Stone Tower Temple now represents Link confronting his final and most hurtful trauma, that he was banished from his homeland. He confronts the place where Machora originated from. One way to read the story is that Machora got released when Link turned his back to the Goddess of Time, the royal family and Zelda. That's what the Stone Tower represents metaphorically. And with this we can finally answer the question which part of the popular fan theory I see a bit differently. See, the idea in the theory is it that the people of Termina had forsaken Goddess of Time and chose to worship the giants instead. I believe this to be different. As I understand the story, the opposite is the case. The people of Termina had forsaken the giants. If we look back at the parallels between the stories of Link and the story of Skull Kid, then we can see that the giants in Skull Kid story are standing for Zelda or the goddess in Link's story. So if the tower represents Link's disillusionment with the goddess in a symbolic reading, the parallel in a literal reading of the story would be that the people of Termina became disillusioned with the giants, which is what certainly happened to the Skull Kid. If this is what happened, then this would explain a couple of things. The first one are the four phallic pillars. The theories that I'm familiar with interpret those four pillars as a mockery towards the goddess, and that's something that never quite made sense to me. You know, the four pillars are the four giants depicted in a phallic way. Depictions of a clerical symbol in a phallic way usually isn't done to mock other beliefs, it's done to mock one's own. The designer Tom Ford managed to produce quite an outrage because he sold crosses that looked like this. You'll never guess who was outraged because of those symbols. I'll give you a small hint, it wasn't the Buddhists. I believe those four pillars are a mockery of the giants. The other thing that this would explain are the two items that Link finds in the dungeon. In the Stone Tower Temple, Link finds two items. First, the light arrows. So, to understand the meaning of the light arrows, we once again have to go back to Ocarina of Time. In Ocarina of Time, the light arrows are the very last item that Link acquires. They are handed to him by Zelda herself. In my reading, Link taking the light arrows in the Stone Tower Temple represents him forgiving Zelda. You know, he reclaims a gift she once gave him. He once again becomes a warrior fighting for the light in Zelda. The second thing that is hidden in the temple is the giant's mask, which I believe represents the same thing towards the giants. It represents Link becoming a giant himself, another form of a warrior for good, this time in the symbolism of Termina instead of the symbolism of Hyrule. Awesome. So at this point in the story, Link went symbolically through the stages of grief. He reached acceptance about what happened to him, he confronted all his main traumas and forgave them, and he even visited the place that Machora originated from and managed to forgive Zelda there. At the same time, we now have greed all the giants. If we now confront Skalkid atop the tower during the final night, then we can play the old to order to summon them. The giants appear and stop the moon from falling. But, as it turns out, the giants aren't strong enough to stop the catastrophe once and for all. If we really want to stop the moon from crashing into Termina, we have to enter the moon ourselves. <laughs> In Ocarina of Time, the Water Temple is found in the middle of Lake Hylia. In the middle of this temple, one of the most interesting events of the game takes place. Link walks through a seemingly normal door. 
and suddenly finds himself in a room whose existence is physically impossible in this space. The water on the ground shows Link's reflection. The room is entirely empty, but for the tree in its center. And then one of the most memorable combat encounters in the history of the Zelda series happens. Link is attacked by a shadow version of himself. He is literally attacked by his own dark self. If we want to understand what exactly is going on here, we have to press the pause button for a second and rewind to the beginning of Ocarina of Time. At the beginning of Ocarina of Time, Link is a child. We first make it through the Deco Temple, then through the Fire Temple, next through the Water Temple, and then we pull out the Master Sword in the Temple of Time. This transforms Child Link into an adult and releases Ganondorf into the world. So, at this point of the story, we are still Child Link, but we are in the body of an adult. You know, Link did not really grow up, his child self just got magically transformed into an adult. He's a child in an adult body. And now, Ocarina of Time does something very interesting. We now play through another forest temple, through another fire temple, and finally, through another water temple. And in this water temple, we suddenly fight against the shadow version of ourselves in front of a tree. So this tree here is quite important, because this tree is a Bodhi tree, a Buddhist symbol of awakening and enlightenment. Which brings us to the part of the video we've all been desperately waiting for. The digression into esoteric Buddhism. Okay, so a disclaimer, there are tons of different schools of Buddhism out there, and I'm by no means qualified to say anything of value about Buddhist symbolism and Matoras Mass outside of the very basics. So I've kept this very basic. If someone is interested in a deeper dive into the Buddhist lore behind Matoras Mask, I left a great video by Max Derrett in the description that I wholeheartedly can recommend. Okay, so pure land Buddhism, the most prevalent form of Buddhism in Japan. One of the core beliefs of Buddhism is that all life is suffering and we are endlessly reborn into this suffering. If we do good deeds while living, we acquire karma. If we acquire a lot of karma, we will be reborn in a better realm of suffering in our next reincarnation. You know, it's still suffering, but it is better suffering. And then there is enlightenment. Enlightenment or nirvana is reached if people manage to escape the endless cycle of suffering and rebirth by following the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha was the first person to reach enlightenment, and he did so under a tree. A Bodhi tree, to be precise. Because of this, the Bodhi tree is a symbolism for enlightenment or spiritual adulthood. The tree in the water temple is a Bodhi tree. It is a symbol for spiritually growing up and for reaching enlightenment. Symbolically, Link is facing his own dark side here under a Bodhi tree. He's fighting against his dark self in a literal reflection room. Defeating Dark Link here symbolizes Link reaching spiritual adulthood. It symbolizes Link becoming enlightened. When Link pulled the Master Sword out at the Temple of Time, his body became an adult, but his mind stayed a child. Link's mind only reaches adulthood when he literally conquers his own dark reflection in a water temple under a Bodhi tree. Awesome. So why are we waffling about Link becoming enlightened uh, by defeating his own dark self under a Bodhi I tree? I see that as a rather ass, severe weakness. Because of the inside of the moon. See? There's no one apart from Uma who can the instant the kill. And suddenly and we find ourselves to do it. this landscape. standing around us, and in front of us is a giant tree with five children laying around it. This tree is another Bodhi tree. The inside of the moon mirrors the setting of the water temple. Below this tree, we can initiate the final fight against Machora. The final fight against Machora mirrors Link defeating Dark Link in Ocarina of Time. In order to become enlightened, Link must confront and conquer his own mind. Machora is symbolic of the darkness inside of himself. When Link enters the moon, he symbolically enters his own mind confront the darkness within himself. Here's a fun thing to think about. If the moon represents Link's own mind, then it suddenly makes a lot of sense that the moon has a face in the game, doesn't it? Because behind the static grim of the moon, Link's consciousness is metaphorically hidden. Here's another thing that is fun to think about. If the moon represents Link's mind, then the moon crashing into Termina might be a metaphor for Link slowly losing his mind, you know? The mind crashing into Earth, destroying everything in the process, sounds like a symbolic representation for going insane to me, which would perfectly fit with the idea that Link might be lying in the Lost Woods, slowly transforming into a skull kit. But that's just a side note. Back to esoteric Buddhism with us. In Ocarina of Time, there is a little shop in the middle of Hyrule City's market. This shop is run by the Happy Mask Salesman. The first time we speak with him, he says the following. Welcome to the Happy Mask Shop. 
We deal in masks that bring happiness to everyone. How would you like to be a happiness salesman? I lend you a mask, you sell the mask and bring the money back here. If you want to read the fine print, take a look at the sign over there. After you sold all the masks, you will become happy yourself. Have faith. This final sentence here is what I believe to be one of the main motifs in Machoro's mask. After you sold all the masks, you will become happy yourself. Have faith. Premia, Ramona's sister, speaks another really core sentence on a Ramoni ranch. With every good deed, a child takes one step closer to adulthood. I believe those two sentences are at the center of Machoros Mask's narrative. It's taking a while, but now we've finally established every piece of the puzzle that we need to make sense of Machoros Mask's weirdness. So let's finally try to piece this together. Let's try to figure out what Machoros Mask is all about. At the center of the narrative is Link's trauma after the events of Ocarina of Time. Every area in the game represents one specific trauma. In the actual order, Link went through. I'm tired. At first, I'm he was innocently here. punished by trying to protect Zelda. Then, else. after defeating Ganondorf, he lost his newfound power. And